Major Lindsay and Africa presents Bouncing Back, conversations about resilience for lawyers. Welcome to Bouncing Back, Resilience for Lawyers. This podcast is brought to you by Major, Lindsay, and Africa, the global leader in legal search and consulting. I'm your host, Rebecca Glatzer. I'm a managing director in the associate practice group at Major, Lindsay, and Africa. In this podcast, I speak to successful professionals about the hiccups, bumps, bruises, and setbacks they've experienced in their careers and personal lives, and how they ultimately bounce back from those experiences. Today, my guest is Dory Clark. Dory has been named one of the top 50 business thinkers in the world by Thinkers 50 and was recognized as the number one communication coach in the world by the Marshall Goldsmith Leading Global Coaches Awards. A consultant and keynote speaker, Dory teaches executive education at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business and Columbia Business School. She's the author of Entrepreneurial You, Reinventing You, and Stand Out which was named the number one leadership book of 2015 by Inc. Magazine. Her newest book, The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World, will be available in print on September 21st and can be pre-ordered now. Dory is a frequent contributor to the Harvard Business Review and has been described by the New York Times as an expert at self-reinvention and helping others make changes in their lives. Thank you for being my guest today, Dory. Oh my goodness, Rebecca, thanks for having me. This is great. Well, let's get started. By all measures, at least my measures, <laughs> you are incredibly successful, but it all wasn't always that way. Uh, you have let me know that you've had three book proposals rejected before you were even published for your first book. In your 20s, you were turned down by every doctoral program you applied to. And when you started as a consultant back in the day, your requests to blog for free for top publications were met with silence. They didn't even respond to you. And now you are a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Inc., and a host of others. Uh, how did you get from getting doors figuratively slammed in your face to the incredible success you have now? Well, I think the first thing, of course, was a a willingness to uh, to just you know, like a, <laughs> uh, like a, like a moth to a flame <laughs> to keep, uh, <laughs> to keep pushing, even when there were a lot of rejections. I remember, for instance, that one of the goals that I had was wanting to start doing some teaching at business schools. And this was a little bit of an uphill battle because I did not, I did not have an MBA. I did not have a PhD. Uh, so I didn't have the typical qualifications, but this was a goal. And so I literally spent days, you know, full days creating Excel spreadsheets of business schools and making lists of de- department chairs and their contact information and seeing who I knew on LinkedIn who might know them or would be willing to do an introduction and then writing out cold emails to pitch them on guest lecturing or perhaps offering a course. And so through that brute force, I mean, I was in touch with literally dozens and dozens of schools and eventually I was able to guest lecture for a number of places. And eventually I ended up with a long-term teaching engagement at Duke, but, uh, but it w- it was very much a process of, uh, repeatedly being turned down and rejected and, uh, just needing to keep going. What within you made you go, Hey, like I need to keep going. Um, it doesn't matter that I've been directed rejected a bunch of times or nobody's returning my phone calls, Um, you know, can you pinpoint what for you, um, you know, was the spark or the thing that um, made you want to keep going? Well, mostly I felt like I was right and they were wrong. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I th- I think that a a place where where a lot of us run into trouble is that we are far too quick to assume that gatekeepers know what they're doing. That is that is really not at all true, and uh, oftentimes they 
they don't have good critical judgment or they have their own agenda. And it's not that it's our fault or it's not that our work isn't good. It just might not be to their taste or it might not be what they're looking for in the moment. But it doesn't mean that some definitive judgment has been rendered or should be rendered based on that. I mean, in my new book, The Long Game, I tell the story about a woman who's actually a coaching client of mine named Anne. And, you know, Anne was really smart. She was really good. And and she was a regular contributor to uh, to different publications. She was even a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review. And there was this other publication that she started writing for. And she's doing this completely for free on her own time. Over the course of six months, she writes 35 articles for them. And at the end of six months, they fire her. Like, literally, they're like, oh. okay, hey, Anne, you're writing for free for us. Don't do that anymore because we don't like your work. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, okay. Talk about offensive and upsetting. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, just about anyone would be pretty crushed by that. And so she was feeling really bad. So she decided she would reach out to friends and try to see how they had coped with similar setbacks. And one woman that she reached out to, you know, she, she said, oh, you know, gee, Anne, I, I had a similar thing happen to me. And Anne said, well, what did you do? How did you overcome it? And the woman said, oh, well, I never wrote again. <laughs> and Anne heard that and thought, oh, God, that's not going to be me. I'm not yeah. going to be the one that never writes again because someone rejected me. And so, she, you know, God bless her. She got back on the horse. And within a few months, she identified another equally prestigious business publication that she now continues to write for. Uh, but, you know, this one editor that didn't like her work, that was rude to her. I mean, that's that's one person's judgment. That is not a judgment from the universe. Yeah. I, I mean, that's a fantastic point. And I think it's something... Um that doesn't get talked about, right, <laughs> um, in a lot of circles. Um, it, 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 to your point, you know, the people that you are trying to get to hire you or to publish you or to do something um, could be too busy. It could be, again, you're, you're not what they're trying to do right now. They want a different slant. They want a different type of candidate. They want something else. Um, you know, I sometimes encourage my candidates to, if they can, go back to the <laughs> the entity that's telling them no and see if they can get feedback um you know but sometimes that's not always possible what if, what are your thoughts on that uh in terms of you know if you keep getting the door slammed in your face and you're trying to okay what do i need to do differently is it really just um you know volume like keep asking for more um or do i need to kind of recalibrate what what are your thoughts on that yeah, it's it's hard because at first uh, you you just really don't know. I mean, you if you have one point one data point or two or even five data points, it's just really not quite enough information because all of that could be could be just bad luck. You know, um, it's as we have learned in the world of data science, there's a lot of statistical noise and. You know, you actually could be someone who's, let's say, a job candidate, and people actually do lose out sometimes because the person interviewing them was was hungry and wanted to go to lunch. I mean, like stuff like that happens. You, right, pr right. you probably all heard about the study yeah. about the Israeli judges. So, yes, exactly. And the, the the you know the likelihood of you probably being found guilty or going to jail increases uh, uh, after after lunchtime and <laughs> uh, when they're tired and sleepy and exhausted, whereas, you know, uh, a, a possible better result might be better during the day or later in the day when they're fresh and newly caffeinated. Yeah, yeah, this is a thing. This is a real yeah, thing. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say in general, we should try to do two things. The first is I honestly wouldn't wouldn't even try to go too far down the rabbit hole of speculation until you have more data. You know, if you if you you know miss out on on one or two opportunities, that that really could be just luck. And so sometimes you can begin to psych yourself out by say, you know, unless something's really obvious like oh wow, they asked a question and I totally didn't know the answer to it or something like that. But if yeah. you can't figure out what went wrong, it's sometimes not helpful to be like, oh, but what could it be? You know, should I have worn a red shirt and not a blue shirt? You know, it's it's right. like you make yourself <laughs> crazy. So I think part of it is just giving yourself an appropriate number of at-bats 
And then secondly, this is really a place where trusted friends can be valuable to you. You know, and it, when I say friends, I mean people who certainly care about you and want the best for you, but also should be knowledgeable in your world. Uh, I don't mean right. someone who has a, you know, random job and they don't know anything about the yes. law or whatever, but yes. they can often help mirror things back to you or give you some tips or give you some guidance that can be helpful. Yeah, definitely. Though, so not your mom, because uh, your mom loves you no matter what, <laughs> but and thinks you're great. Um, but perhaps you know someone who's like more senior to you, or someone who achieved the goal that you're trying to achieve, or maybe even an outside consultant like a Dory Clark if you're in the business realm, or a recruiter like myself, or again, you know, someone else who knows something about what they're talking about and can give you some honest, real, and truthful advice. Um, well, one of the things I've, in anticipation of doing this podcast story, I uh, borrowed uh, some some different things from, from my wife, who, who's a professor, and she said, go read some stuff about resilience and, you know, better understand what we're talking about when we're talking about resilience. And um, in a lot of the literature, there uh, is this sort of commonality, which is that People who are ultimately successful in life and exhibit resilience often have um, experiences in their formative years or mentors in their formative years that, you know, for someone who, you know, also had a lot of resilience, they watched them deal with defeat and setbacks and learn some lessons from, from watching that other person. Um, and that created the resilience in them. Um, so it's not necessarily innate. I mean, there are some genetic and other factors that kind of go into whether or not um, someone can be, you know, is innately resilient, but it's also something that can be learned. And, and so I'm curious for you, um, I, I like how you said earlier, <laughs> I knew they were wrong. Um, so there's some confidence there. <laughs> there's some resilience there, uh, you know, as indicated by that statement. And I'm curious that, you know, for you in your formative formative years or, or, or in your early career uh, life, you know, what, what helped, you know, what experiences helped you um, to develop that resilience bone, if you will? Well, I think part of it, honestly, is just not, and <laughs> not having a choice. And, you know, I, I, I think that um, when it comes to resilience, I mean, honestly, um, we almost do ourselves a disservice by assuming it's a choice to be resilient. I mean, like, come on, people, you got to support yourself. <laughs> and so right, right. like at a certain point, you got to pick yourself up. Yeah, so definitely. In, in my case, um, my very first job that I had uh, when I finished graduate school was I was a newspaper reporter and less than a year into the job, I got laid off from that job. And th there were there were a lot of unfortunate aspects to it. One was that um, they were they were just cheap mofos, and uh, they gave me four days of severance pay. So, Ooh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I had uh, uh, I had worked for them for for a year, a little less than a year, and they said, "Whoa, we give one one week of severance pay per uh, per year that you've worked." So really generous. So I had basically four days to figure out how I was going to support myself and how I was going to pay the bills. Yeah. Uh, so that is a yeah. very sharp motivating factor. The other unfortunate element was that I got laid off on Monday, September 10th, 2001. So the day that I was going to start my job search was, uh, was really, really not the best day to be starting a job search in American history. No, no. <laughs> not at all. Would you walk our listeners through Kind of your thought process at that point it was like okay crud um <laughs> i've got four days of severance uh you know for the, again the, the the young folk um let me just you know tie things together here september 11th happened the next day uh the the world came to a screeching halt um you know economically things were not great for this in this country um at that moment in time i too was kind of in a similar boat so what what was your th what was sort of the thinking that got you to you know if you take us back to that point in time um, that was that you know that helped you kind of pull yourself up from the bootstraps and figure out what to do next? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, ultimately, I think my focus just really lasered in on how am I going to make money? How am I going to support myself? 
uh, because that that was the immediate cause at hand. I mean, it is conceivable. I mean, cer certainly my my parents would have allowed me to move back in with them if needed. Um, but they lived in uh, a town that I hated in a state that I didn't want to be in that was, mm -hmm. you know, a 15 hour drive from where I currently lived. I mean, it was it was not like, oh, you know, I can just continue my regular uh, my regular life from here. Um, it, it would have meant uprooting everything that I had attempted to build and going back to uh, a very confined place that I uh, didn't want to be in. So it really seemed like not at all a good option. And of, of course, uh, things were not really done via Zoom back in the day. There was not such a thing as Zoom back in the day. So uh, it, it would have limited things quite severely. So yeah, I, I just went into overdrive and uh, I said, all right, I've, I've got to find a solution. And pretty much no one was hiring. I mean, you can imagine in the, in the middle of a massive recession and a terrorist attack, hiring new staff is not at the top of most people's lists. But I tried to have as many networking meetings as possible. I, I just, you know, met with everybody I could. And I also began really aggressively seeking out freelance journalist work, which was what I could get. And so I was making connections at, around that. And honestly, it was really good training because as a journalist, specifically as a freelancer, you only make money for the articles that you sell. And so that means that you have to learn very quickly to create a very high hit rate. You can't be coming up with story ideas that are terrible uh, because eventually yeah. the editors are going to stop taking your call. You have to learn how to create pitches that are incredibly appealing and and sell them fast because otherwise you're you're not getting paid uh so it was actually a, a pretty effective forcing function and uh and training mechanism for me to you know it forced me to reverse engineer you know what what makes a good story what makes it appealing to an editor um which is a skill that certainly has stayed with me yeah no that's great that's great um and like you said the necessity is the mother of the <laughs> And um, being in pain, meaning I don't know if I can pay my bills is a great impetus, which I will tell you, I'll, I'll say this, this is my own opinion. Um, you know, a lot of the lawyers that I work with are a little bit too comfortable, in my own opinion. Um, sometimes that leads to um, this sort of long-term unhappiness and sort of malaise, right? It's the devil I know. Um, well, let me back up. I mean, you probably know this. You know, the, the legal profession um, is fairly linear, right? You know, you go to undergrad, you graduate, you do halfway decent, you know, you do decent on the LSATs, you go to law school. Uh, your first uh, and second summers, you hopefully get a halfway decent job with some kind of employer. If it goes well, you get a job after you graduate. You pass the bar, you start working, boom, you're a lawyer, you're off and running. And I think that linear path is sometimes a disservice uh, to my brothers and sisters in the profession because they didn't have to think about, okay, what is a long-term, what's, what's my long-term goal? Am I gonna love doing this forever? Um, they've got blinders on, they're working very long hours in a very focused way. And all of a sudden they pick their head up and they're 10 years into the profession and they're like, oh, this is not working for me, or I'm really unhappy, or this is not the right environment, or what else can I do with my law degree? Um, and I think that kind of gets at like your most recent book and, you know, quick plug, all of Dory's books are awesome. I own them all. They're all very valuable. You should buy them all. But <laughs> um, uh, this new one coming out is very interesting to me because, you know, I, I think the gist is essentially how do you carve out time to figure out what you're going to do in your long-term career and your long-term life. Um, how do you, in the now, 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 rush, 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 we only have 24 hours of, in a day, and we're also trying to take care of children and elderly parents and our own mental and physical health. How do you, you know, figure out what you want to do in the long term and how do you start making moves now so that you eventually get there, right? Um, and I, I was wondering if you could kind of share a little bit of, you know, don't, don't give it all the way, don't give away all the spoilers, <laughs> but, um, just sort of your, your thoughts on how a busy working lawyer with a spouse and kids and a pet um, and 
lots of student loans, which is also kind of a hindrance for many of us, um, you know, who have $200,000 in debt from, from law school, sometimes more, um, when you really want to ultimately do something else or try to figure out how to take the job you have now and turn it into something that you really enjoy and don't hate. Yes, it, it's really important to ask that reinvention question because it's uh, it's certainly not uh, unprecedented that uh, a mid-career professional uh, might decide, oh gosh, you know, this isn't exactly what I thought it was going to be, or oh wow, I have developed some other interests that seem a lot more compelling now. And so particularly for lawyers, you're exactly right, Rebecca. It's tough because, you know, when I started my own business, when I started to work for myself, I had the advantage, frankly, of a low bar. I, I had worked, you know, as you heard, unsuccessfully as a journalist. Uh, I had worked on political campaigns as a, as a spokesperson on political campaigns. I And the immediate thing that I was doing before running my business was I was a nonprofit executive director. And so when I left, my salary was $45,000 a year. And I thought, you know what? I am pretty sure I can find a way to do something that will bring in that much money. <laughs> and I, yeah. I felt pretty <laughs> solid about that. And, but it's it's pretty different if you're making, you know, two hundred, three hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000 a year. It's like, are you going right. to gin that up overnight? You know, eh, probably not, actually. Uh, it will probably take some time for you to be able to replicate that salary. And so you begin to ask, well, you know, how much is it worth to me in a, in a right. literal sense and a metaphorical sense? So yeah. I think that uh, one of the things that I like to advise, and I talk about this actually a lot in my first book, Reinventing You, is the value of a long runway. Because, you know, certainly there are circumstances where you might just feel like, okay, you have hit your limit. You've got to get out of there. You are not happy. You're miserable. You're sick all the time because you hate what you're doing. Okay. If it's gotten that bad, then, then leave. But if it's not, if you're actually in the sort of middling state that a lot of people are, <laughs> which is, you know, yeah. well, it's okay. <laughs> I can, I can deal with it. I can do it. You know, I like my colleagues, you know, whatever. Um, if you're it's in that fun. place, yeah, it's if it's, <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, if if it's one of those situations where it's not an emergency, then one of the things that I, I really advise is to to just go slowly over a longer period of time. And so in reinventing you, I actually tell the story of a woman named Patricia Fripp, who was a hairdresser of all things, and she reinvented herself as a very successful professional speaker. And it might seem like, uh, you know, how, how do you do that? Like, that's sort of a big leap. But part of her secret was that she had a 10-year lease on her salon. And so that was her timing. She wasn't going to break her lease. She said, okay, I'm, I'm doing this for 10 years. And so over that 10-year period, it, you know, like everything, right? At first, she's speaking for free to get practice, to get exposure. Eventually, she's speaking and they're paying her a couple hundred bucks, you know? But all the money she would make, she would reinvest into her business and, you know, she would use it to pay for a nice website or she'd use it to pay for additional training or for nice videos. And over this te extended 10 year period, she was able to build up such a side business of speaking that eventually it wasn't a side business anymore. And 10 years later, she hands over the keys to her salon and she's able to literally just saunter into her new career in professional speaking. She has more than made up for the income she made as a hairdresser. Um, and there's been zero disruption. And so I think that oftentimes that might be the, the better path for attorneys. It doesn't have to be yeah. 10 years, but it probably no. can't be tomorrow. Exactly. That's exactly right. And it might be that you're doing this stuff on the weekends. You're doing this. I, I, I have another great example from a personal friend. He loves loved and continually loves and currently loves baking um specifically pound cakes uh his grandma taught him how to make a pound cake and it's just something that he's always loved and enjoyed and sharing that with other people and he was a lawyer for many many years and on the weekends and when he was things got slow at work um he would just literally pound out pound cakes 
and then felt like, you know, initially give them away to people and he got, you know, feedback about flavors and this, that, and the other thing, um, type, you know, chocolate chip versus banana nut or whatever, and then kind of honed his recipes and then eventually started selling them on a small scale. And then it got to the point where he needed a commercial oven. So he, you know, saved up some money to get a commercial access to commercial ovens and multiple commercial ovens. And then eventually, you know, he kind of ramped up and got some help. And now that's what he does full time. Um, so sometimes it's, it's, you know, squeezing out time in your day to do the thing that you enjoy. And I think you, you've hinted at this a couple of times when you talk about this in Standing Out. Um, you talk about it, I think, in all of your books. But it's, it, that's one of the, the, the takeaways for me from, from Stand Out was sometimes you have to give away the product or the service for free. Um, and another example of this, um, and I'd love for you to, to talk more about it, is, you know, lawyers who are trying to change practice areas, maybe they want to stay lawyer, but they want to shift from being a litigator to a data privacy expert. And sometimes that involves um, educating yourself on that other practice area and then writing about it so that you sound like an expert. Can you can you talk a little bit about that that piece of your advice, which kind of is a theme throughout many of your books? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the basic idea is uh, nobody really wants to be your guinea pig. <laughs> and so, right. you know, we, right. we need to find ways so that, number one, they're not our guinea pig. And number two, so that we are conveying to other people that we do have expertise, we do have something to offer, and we can uh, we can provide value to them. So to your point, Rebecca, uh, if we want to learn about something, a great way to, to both simultaneously educate yourself in the form of professional development and also telegraph to others that you are that you are interested in this new area, that you have knowledge to share about this new area, is to write. Uh, or, or otherwise share content, you know, it could be speaking or whatever, about the areas that you want to go into. Uh, so that's number one. And then number two is, you know, d depending on the topic and things like that, uh, it, it literally could be volunteering in some way. I mean, if there is uh, a charity, for instance, where uh, you would be able to, uh, to, to help them out and provide uh, assistance, uh, perhaps that could, could help you gain expertise in that area and also uh, it's a form of social proof to have done that so so there's there's a variety of possibilities involved no i think this is great well um any other sort of comments but but before uh we go we're right at the 30 minute mark um anything you uh else you would like to share with our listening audience um you know about about bouncing back in light of, you know, COVID and everything that we have experienced as a collective, a world collective, it's called pandemic for a reason. It's the entire world is affected. Um, over the last year and a half, um, you know, curious if you have any um, advice or anything to share uh, for our listening audience. Yeah, thank you so much. I would say in general, I mean, during the pandemic, we all got really good at flexing our adaptability muscles, you know, we're like, like it or not, we had to adapt, we had to uh, very rapidly respond to changes and uh, pivot. And that is great. That is, of course, a great thing to be able to do. But it has its limits, because you don't only want to be pivoting, you don't only want to be uh, responding to stimuli. Um, part of resilience is, you know, it's not it's not just sort of getting getting back on the path you were on, it's interrogating where you want to go and setting that vision so that you are headed in the right direction. And so that's part of why I'm so excited about the concept around my new book, The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World, because I, I see it in a lot of ways as kind of uh, reclaiming control, reclaiming agency by being a long-term thinker and setting a long-term vision for ourselves and where we want our lives and careers to go. So I'll just mention that for anybody who's interested, I actually have a free resource, which is the Long Game Strategic Thinking Self-Assessment, and anyone who is interested can get it for free at doryclark.com slash the long game. Fantastic. Well, Dory, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with our listeners today. I know they will find them valuable. Uh, I sincerely appreciate your time. And as one, again, final reminder, uh, Dory's latest book, The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World, will be available in print and for download on September 21st and can be pre-ordered now. Thank you so, so much for your time. Thanks, Rebecca. Great to be here.
Thank you for listening to Bouncing Back, Resilience for Lawyers. Join us next time for another story about thriving after overcoming challenges. You can find Bouncing Back and other programming for lawyers on MLA's Legal Talk Network.